Welcome to Baptist Medical News Network. I'm Rhonda McRae. Thank you for joining us. Today we're talking about pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so to help us with this, we've got pulmonologist Dr. Timothy Cannon joining us today. Dr. Cannon, thank you for coming today. You're welcome. So right off the bat, let's just get it started. Tell us what this is, pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH. Okay. Uh, first of all, unoxygenated blood typically uh, enters the right side of the heart where it is propelled into the lung via the pulmonary artery or pulmonary circulation. It is in the lung that these uh, unoxygenate, unoxygenated blood cells pick up oxygen and then the blood moves to the left side of the heart where it is propelled to all the tissues in the body to provide uh, fuel or oxygen. Uh, typically a normal blood pressure is around 120 over 80. Uh, in the right side of the heart or the pulmonary arterial circulation, we have a low pressure system with a pressure typically in the range of 25 over 10. In patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension or PAH, the blood vessels that uh, provide uh, access to the lung become thickened and somewhat stiff, causing the pressures in the right side of the lung, uh, heart to elevate. And as the pressures become elevated, the right heart has to work especially hard to get this blood out into the lungs. And those patients with elevated pressure are said to have PAH. And what, what causes that thickening? Uh, there are some secondary causes. Uh, this is most commonly associated with some of the connective tissue disorders or collagen vascular diseases. The one that uh, we see mostly associated with this is scleroderma. It's also associated with some congenital heart diseases. It is associated with uh, some drugs, uh, the most common being the weight loss drugs like FinFin. Uh, we also see it with illicit drugs, and the ones most commonly associated with PAH are cocaine uh, use, amphetamine use, or methamphetamine use. And finally, we see uh, PAH associated with patients with HIV infections. There is a subset of people with pulmonary hypertension who um, don't have any association with any of these things mentioned previously. And those patients um, we declare as having a primary disease or primary pulmonary hypertension, or another term for that is PAH. Okay. So who then is at risk for this condition? Um, we know that the patients who are associated with these drug use are at risk. Uh, we also know that patients who um, have underlying lung disease will be associated uh, with PAH. For example? Patients who uh, have underlying emphysema or interstitial lung diseases will frequently develop a uh, increased pressure in the right side of the heart. Okay. All right, so if a person has this condition, would they know it? What, what would the symptoms be? Typically a patient would present to my office with uh, shortness of breath. Uh, fatigue, uh, maybe a little lightheadedness if they climbed stairs or did anything exertional. And then finally, in the more advanced cases, they'll come in with lower extremity swelling or edema, and sometimes increasing abdominal girth where they develop fluid around the liver. So those conditions can be um, mistaken for other, those symptoms rather can be mistaken for other conditions. They can. So typically a workup in my office would include, uh, after the history and physical are done, uh, some diagnostic tests looking at their pulmonary function uh, to determine whether there's any underlying lung disease. We'll look at x-rays, uh, perhaps a CT of the chest. The one test that's most helpful in making the diagnosis is an ultrasound of the heart or an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram is a really good non-invasive way to measure or estimate the pressure in the right side of the heart. You can't stop there, however. Uh, if, you elevate, if you see an elevated pressure on the echocardiogram, then we will typically have our cardiologists do a right and left heart catheterization to actually measure that pressure before initiating treatment. Uh, the right-sided pressures can be measured using a venous catheter that's uh, threaded up into the right side of the heart. We also want to look at the left side of the heart and look at the circulation to make sure there aren't any coronary artery blockages and, and that there's no evidence of congestive heart failure. Okay, so if you have this condition, it, it goes maybe misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. What, what can happen if, it doesn't, if it's not treated? As, as the disease progresses, you, you typically have a, a classification, uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, one through four. 
Uh, stage one, typically a patient is asymptomatic. Uh, as the disease progresses to stage two, you are pretty comfortable at rest, but uh, have some difficulty breathing with uh, more strenuous exertions, such as climbing stairs or exercising. As it progresses to stage three, uh, you still are fairly comfortable at rest, but you find that you really can't do uh, things that you uh, normally associated with activities of daily living without some difficulty, like getting dressed or showered or uh, you know, providing your own hygiene. In the more advanced cases, uh, stage four, the patient is typically very short of breath, even at rest. And these are the patients who really start seeing a lot of a lower extremity edema or swelling. So I would think that it would not be uncommon then for you to see a patient at stage four maybe for the first time. It's not uncommon and typically patients present in at least stage three or four. Okay. Uh, a lot of the patients in stage two think, well, it may just be part of aging. It mm -hmm. could be for some other reason that I can't quite do the exercises I used to do. Mm -hmm. um, then is or, does increased age increase your risk for this or does it? No, not necessarily. Okay, all right. Okay, well then let's talk about the treatments. What are the available treatments for the condition? Fortunately, we have more, more drugs available. There are three classifications of drugs. Uh, we have the prostanoids, we have the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and we also have the endothelin uptake antagonists. Those are kind of big words, but all those three types or classes of drugs work to decrease the thickening in the pulmonary artery to decrease this smooth muscle proliferation which causes the artery to get more narrow and more stiff. Uh, we typically will start with the, with the simpler drugs which can be give, given by mouth. And uh, as the disease progresses, uh, we will add a second class of drug. And then in the more advanced cases, we'll add uh, some of the injectable drugs. Some can be given uh, under the skin using a subcutaneous, uh, drug pump, like an insulin pump, uh, which gives the drug continuously. In the more advanced stage four disease, we will sometimes put an intravenous catheter in and provide a continuous infusion of the drug. But um, we typically just add one drug as the patient progresses and don't really stop the, the, the initial drug. It becomes more like a cocktail of drugs uh, eventually. Okay. So you talk about the disease progressing. Um, does it uh, does it always progress or can some of these treatments basically stop it in its tracks? Our, our goal is to stabilize the disease. It's not a curable disease, but our goal would be to initiate therapy, follow the patient very closely, and in our office what we typically do is what is uh, called a six-minute walk test where we have a specific uh, measured uh, track and we ask the patient to walk at a comfortable pace for six minutes. We measure how many meters they can walk. If we see that they're losing ground, we'll perhaps add a second drug or a third drug. Um, we typically will ask our cardiologist to repeat a right heart cath at intervals, usually at six months to a year, to see if the drugs are effective. Great. All right. Well, then, we've talked about some of the risks. So um, it's, it seems like some of the risk factors for this condition are preventable. So if a person is hearing this, what what would you suggest in terms of uh, self-measures for prevention? Uh, we know that the, uh, the drug, drug use uh, is preventable. Uh, so we would obviously recommend staying away from those, those um, substances. Uh, we know that some types of pulmonary disease are preventable, especially uh, smoking-related pulmonary disease, which can cause a secondary hypertension in the, uh, in the lung. Uh, most of the others are not, and we just recommend uh, coming in and being checked out if you find yourself a little more short of breath. Uh, uh, it's better to be proactive and if you notice some symptoms changing in your life to go ahead and have your uh, internist or family practitioner evaluate you and get your referral made uh, if necessary. So that kind of leads to really my last question here. Is this condition like so many other diseases, the earlier caught the better? Absolutely. Uh, if we can slow down the progression of the disease, keep these arteries from getting thicker and stiffer, we know the patient's symptoms are going to uh, clearly be um, um, much easier to control. Uh, yes. So the, the message then would be for anybody that might, might, you might be concerned that you're at risk or might even have a little bit of shortness of breath, definitely see your doctor and get on this early on. 
Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Cannon, thank you so much for joining us today for this. And we hope that you will tune back in for our future webcast. Thanks for joining us.